And so you say, well, tradition, you know, no. It's like all you do is destabilize yourself. And you might think, well, that's okay. It's not okay. It's unbelievably stressful physiologically. It's terrifying. It's painful. It's devastating for the people around you. And it's destabilizing for society. In no manner is that okay unless that's what you want. And if that's what you want, well, heaven help you and the rest of us for that matter. Viewpoint diversity. No, it's not another diversity. That's the wrong way of going about it. It's not part of a list of things that are okay or necessary or desirable. It's the core of consciousness itself. And then you might think, well, consciousness, you know, here we are, pathetic specks on the edge of a desolate, meaningless universe. Who cares about consciousness? Well, it's not obvious that there's any reality without consciousness. How about consciousness as a world engendering force? How about that? How about, how about consciousness as something that the cosmos as such would not exist without? Well, what do you think we're hypothesizing about with the imaginative representations of our religious traditions? Why do you think the word is elevated to the highest place in those symbolic routines? Think that's all nothing? It's just old superstition? Yeah, well, you know, our religious beliefs, they suffer often from the same totalitarian proclivity that infects our thinking. Always, it's an existential threat. But that doesn't mean there's nothing there in those stories. There's nothing, that, there's nothing there that we can casually discard and assume nothing catastrophic is going to emerge in the absence of those representations. And you know this, too. You know it at a very deep level. Why? Well, you have a conscience. You misuse your words. See what happens. See what happens. Test it out. You practice to deceive. Well, what happens if you practice? You become what you practice. And I don't mean that metaphysically, although I also mean it metaphysically. I mean that's how you're built. You become what you practice practice to deceive. Well, how is that going to work? To be out of concordance with reality. You think of the totalitarian impulse underneath that temptation to deceive. You are so canny that you can bend the fabric of reality to your desire and get away with it. One thing I learned as a clinician, I never saw anyone ever get away with anything ever. Well, so what do you do as a clinician? Well, you let people talk. And you listen to them, if you're a wise clinician, because what do you know about what's wrong with them, or what they should do, or who they should be? You don't want to take the presumption of assuming you have answers to that question on board. You don't want to do that with your children. You don't want to do that with your wife. You don't even want to do that with yourself. Because what the hell do you know? And so you listen. You listen. And people unfold themselves. And they go just like the pianist who goes back and practices where the errors are and gets it right. That's what happens in therapy. It's like you go back and you find the mistakes. And you think, well, can that be untangled? That seemed to lead to this. That seemed to lead to this. This mistake caused this. This catastrophe is over here. Is it possible to weave that all together now, to straighten all that out, to clean it up, right? And not to bear the terrible suffering that those errors have caused, to leave that behind, right? Everyone's fervent hope, right? Wouldn't it be something if we could be free from the shackles of our pasts, right? Well, it's honesty that does that, but it's a rough route, man. It's through the desert well before the promised land, even if you're escaping from a tyranny. It's no joke. It's no wonder people don't do it. In the short term, it's, it's really rough. But the alternative is far, far worse. Free speech as a precondition for mental 
and social health. Yes, that's exactly right. That's exactly right. And you mess with that. We all mess with that. We all fail to take that into account. We all fail to make that sacred at our extreme peril. Let's talk about that for a minute, sacred. So I had this conversation this week with Sam Harris. I think it's the fifth conversation we had. Sam Harris, you may know and you may not, is well known as a, an author and a thinker, and, but more particularly as one of the members of a group of people who were known as the, the four horsemen of the new atheism, essentially, Christopher Hitchens, Richard Dawkins, Sam Harris, and Daniel Bennett. Um, Harris is anti-religious in a very profound sense, and this is also the case with Dawkins. And they see the totalitarian spirit in religious traditions and fail to distinguish between the two. And I can understand that, you know. It's, it's, a, it's an understandable interpretation, but I don't think it's deep enough to solve the problem because the totalitarian instinct is so deep that merely attributing it even to religion is not going to solve it. It's a deeper problem. It's a deeper problem than can be attributed to any given religious tradition, no matter how fundamentalist. Sam has got interested in the sacred. He meditates, and so he uses his meditation as a journey into the landscape outside of language as to revivify. That's part of the meditative tradition. It's part of the tradition of prayer in the West as well, this notion that there is something outside the barren landscape of linguistic certainty upon which our revivification depends. Uh, so that means that an overemphasis on your certainty puts you in a prison that bars you from the well you need to drink from. And that's worth knowing. And that's what the humanities, in part, try to teach students, even though we don't necessarily know it. Sacred. Sacred implies deep, and so we could speak in a non-religious manner here, we could speak technically and as a matter of definition. We all have an intuition of literary depth, and regardless of our religious beliefs or the absence of them, let's say in the case of an atheist, no one seriously disputes the proposition that some stories are deeper than others. And we feel that. You know, you go to a movie that's deep and you're moved. And that's a strange expression. Like moved where exactly? Well, moved to tears, maybe. Moved to a profound realization. Moved to a transformation in the way you view your life. Moved to a transformation in what you potentially aspire to. All of that, that's movement. It's movement outside of what you knew. And, and it's movement in a direction that's better than what you knew. And wouldn't it all be lovely if we could continue to move in a direction that was always better than what we knew? Is there anything that could possibly be more fervently hoped for than that? So you listen, because maybe someone says something that's a pathway to that. Depth. The deeper, the more sacred. How's that for a definition? What does deep mean? You have an argument with your wife about the dishes, and you both get upset, but it's just about the dishes, so it's shallow. You find out she had an affair. That's deep. Why? Because not much depends on who did the dishes. But your entire view of your future depends on the stability of your relationship with your wife and the promise that you both made to each other. And not only that, your interpretation of who you are might depend on that. And worse than that, your interpretation of what happened in the past, which is already hypothetically fixed, depends on that. Because it could be that the revelation of a lie at that depth demolishes your entire past despite the fact that, hypothetically, it already happened. The deeper something is, the more other things depend on it. Right. What's deepest? 
freedom of speech. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Peterson. We'll, we'll have some time for questions and answers. And um, I think Bella and Josh are going to be on microphones in the aisles here. Uh, they'll come down partway towards the front. And uh, if you'd like to ask a question of Professor Peterson, uh, please line up behind where they are. And remember, since the time is limited, uh, to try to get to your question as quickly as you can. So thank you. Thank you again. You have a lovely town, by the way. It was really nice to be here. I always like coming to the States. It's such a remarkable place. Dr. Peterson, thank you very much for being with us this evening. And very quickly, I just want to say thank you for uh, the work that you've done over the years in your writing and, and lectures. It's, it's been very helpful for me at times in my life, and I very much appreciate that. The question I'd like to ask is that you very often talk about responsibility and the reaction of your audiences when you talk about responsibility and the benefits to oneself when the life of responsibility is taken upon seriously. My question then is, what ultimately is the telos there? the goal, the aim, the end. Is the telos in me, the one who takes on the responsibility? Is it the one for whom I take responsibility, for whom I help others? Or is the telos something else? It's all of those at the same time, if it's, when it's in its perfected form. Right? Because you can think of, we have intimations of paradise, and, and, and that intimation is based at least in part on a notion that peace can be established at multiple levels of organization simultaneously. And it's something that you perceive in music when it's, when it's beautiful, right? Because all of the music has this layered quality, but everything works in accordance with the totality. And so that's why all art aspires to the condition of music, and all speech aspires to the condition of art, let's say. Now, telos, there's no end to its development, but because things could always be better and better, but that's what it's striving for. It's, it's striving for the same thing that's expressed in in the U.S. with the notion that uh, out, of one men, out of many, one, right? E, e pluribus unum. Well, there's a, uni there's a union that's necessary at the highest possible level, which is also part of the drive towards monotheism. And when that responsibility is taken on, it's taken on for your spiritual development and for the stability and health of your family and for the proper placement of your family within the community, the, the narrower community, and then the proper placement of that community within the broader polity, and then all the way up the levels of organization to the highest possible place. And so, and we have a sense of the necessity of that organization and a drive to some degree to attain it. It's, it's part of what gives us vision, let's say, and it's also part of what makes people compelling and charismatic when they emb embody it. Uh, the instinct to, to pursue that is so deep that it, it compels us in imitation. That's worship, by the way, technically speaking. You, know, you imitate what you worship. And so you might say you don't worship. It's like, yeah, right. You just don't know what you're worshiping. That doesn't mean you're not doing it. You don't have a choice. You might be a fractured worshiper, and so you worship all sorts of things, 50 different idols. All that means is that you're a mess. And I mean that technically in some sense, because it, unless there's a uniting force, you're not united. Well, what's disunion within? No one finds that. except under very limited conditions of play, when that's toyed with in some sense, everyone finds that terribly aversive because you're pulled in many directions at once. It's confusing and, and your body has to hyper-prepare because what are you going to do? Fifty different things. Well, it's unbelievably stressful, technically speaking. It's ex exhausting. That, that unity isn't optional. And that's also why something has to be above. 